got your copy of God's Word, I invite you to find the book of Matthew. We're going to continue our series, The Encounters with Jesus. We're going to find ourselves today in Matthew chapter 4. Well, five years ago this month, we were planning our move from Memphis to Geyer Springs, leaving our home of almost eight years, leaving some dear friends and a dear church to join our team here at Geyer Springs. We had packed all week long, had gone to sleep on Friday night, exhausted to move on Saturday morning. And at 5 a.m., the phone rang. And it was my mother-in-law to tell us that our sweet nephew, who'd been battling cancer for a year and a half, had gone to be with the Lord. Taking in the gravity of the situation, I put the phone down, I kind of got up, and it had been an incredibly difficult week. We were moving from one church to another, virtually moving three middle schoolers, was an emotional roller coaster. I kept saying, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, and in that moment I wasn't sure that it was going to be okay. And I told my wife what was going on, and feeling her pain, we just cried for moments. We were in a sinking situation, and everything we owned was in an 18-wheeler trailer 20 feet from our front door. And I wasn't quite sure that this boat wasn't going to capsize. But the Lord is good. Amen? He is faithful. He had church family and church friends from Memphis all the way to Little Rock encourage us, love us, and care for us. And just stand in the gap in our moment of crisis, in our moment of what were we going to do. School was starting and we had lost little Jaron. And so as we sat there and as we think about God's graciousness, I think about this question, how do we stay afloat in our own sinking situations? How do we manage the, the, the storms that, that come our way? And what do you do when you lose your job? What do you do when it, your marriage falls apart? What do you do when you have the news of losing a loved one. And for the last two years in our culture, what do we do in COVID? What do we do when we're sad and depressed and lonely and discouraged? Well, there's an encounter with Jesus here in Mark chapter 4 that I believe helps us understand how they handled their sinking situation. But more than that, I think it reveals who Jesus is in the moments of our difficulties, our pain, and our sorrows. Mark chapter 4, if you've got your copy, I invite you to find verse 35, and we'll read through 41. The word of the Lord says this, And on that day, when evening had come, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, they took him with him in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he woke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Three questions we need to ask when we're trying to stay afloat in the midst of our sinking situation. Number one, God, what is this? God, what is this? Now, the background of this story is that Jesus had been teaching in homes and on the seashore for an incredibly long period of time. He was worn out. He had been accused by the Pharisees. He'd been tried to trick by his friends and his loved ones. And at the end of the day, Jesus is exhausted. And here in verse 36, the, the scripture says the disciples, disciples took Jesus just as he was. Now, this is a unique kind of phrase found in the New Testament. Just as he was in the original language literally meant to take in or care like you were to take in or care for a child. The, Jesus was so tired, the disciples care for a very weary, very ailing Jesus like a parent would care for a child. 
And Jesus calls the disciples to take them to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they're not really sure why they're going to the other side. I don't know if it's for rest. We don't know if it's for additional ministry. But we know that that's exactly what Jesus wants them to do. And so they do that. They dismiss the crowd. They gather the boats. And they begin to sail to the other side. And here is where a good day goes bad. And usually you can't see Christ is coming. Often sudden, without warning, kind of like a nice pet that suddenly bites you. It takes you by surprise. And often we as believers might feel as if we're doing right. We're being obedient to the Lord. We're trying to honor him and his commandments. That somehow we as good believers, mature believers in the faith, are immune to crisis. There's no vaccine for that. In fact, the scripture says, Jesus says in John 16, that you will have trouble in this world, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. The trouble that the disciples were facing is here in verse 37, a great windstorm arose. Now, I think it's interesting, often, as I've read this story, much like you have over your lifetime, we often look over the magnitude of this storm. The word storm here is defined as a great storm or like a hurricane-like storm. So I need you to imagine, if you will, black clouds and sheets of rain and gusts of wind and massive swells that are pitching the boat up and then down and side to side. I need you to imagine, if you will, that water is coming in over the sides and the boat is quickly filling with water and that these experienced sailors are now in fear of their life. That's the kind of storm that's taking place. Welcome crisis. Welcome sinking situation. And when this kind of storm hits your life, we often ask, What is this? The disciples in this horrific moment probably asked this question. They were doing their work, serving the Lord. They had left everything, their families, their home, their job to follow him. And I'm sure they're thinking, and this is it? This is how it's all going to end? The believers we face our own crisis, and we're often rocked by terrible news, whether it's your personal or current events, and we ask ourselves, what is this? Is this what is going on? And it's often in this question that we find ourselves doubting. We find ourselves looking and and almost questioning God's authority, God's power, even God's love for us and God's love for people. Now, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look back at Mark chapter 4. There in verse 35, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. Whose idea was it to go across to the other side? It certainly was not the disciples. It was Jesus. Jesus told them to go to the other side. Now, he knew because he's 100% God and 100% man, and we'll talk about his humanity in a moment, he was fully aware of what was about to happen. But he tells them to go. Now, that just doesn't make sense, now does it? And isn't that the rub when we ask ourselves, what is this? That it doesn't make sense to us, and we want it to make sense. When the storms come and our sinking situation occurs and the crisis is around us and we're not sure what to do or how to feel, it just doesn't make sense, and that's the rub. Let me encourage us this morning. When we ask ourselves, God, what is this? I think it's appropriate for us to hear God's response. Be still. Be still and know this is my plan. Jesus, who only does what the Father wills him to do, has pulled the disciples into the midst of this storm. Now hear me. This storm was part of God's plan. And in that... As we're still, we need to find ourselves in trusting of his power, in having a faith in his will and his plan and his direction, holding fast to the promises that he is there, he is present, he is knowledgeable of our situation. This crisis, this storm, this sinking situation is not outside of God's awareness. Let me encourage us today. Love this portion of scripture. If you're taking notes, write down 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth in verse 7. 
He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show us that all surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted on every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. This, this passage is a great reminder that God is sovereign even in our difficulties. We may feel crushed and perplexed and full of despair, but we can trust in the one who is manifesting himself in us even in our difficulties. Not to be insensitive here, but as we look at the passage of Scripture, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in us the, the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. Paul is reminding the church at Corinth that in their despair, in their problem, in their sinking situation, Jesus is at work. Again, not to be insensitive here, but your crisis is not about you. I need you to hang on to that statement for just a moment. Because some of you this morning are going through some significant pain. And for me to say that to you is like a dagger to your heart. When we become still enough to hear God's voice and remind us as believers, this is my plan. I need us to understand a few things. And we do that when we unpack the scripture a bit more. This boat scene in Mark 4 is one of three boat scenes in the gospel of Mark. Here in Mark 4, then in Mark 6, and then in Mark 8. All of them are associated with a miracle. And all of them challenge the reader and the audience to understand the identity of Jesus. You see, the focal point of this scene and the other boat scenes in Mark is not the disciples. It's not the fishermen. It's not the storm. It's not the circumstance. The focal point is Jesus. What is Jesus doing in the midst of what's going on? And if we could be still in the midst of our pain and ask ourselves, God, what is this? And hear him say, this is me working out a plan in you and through you for my glory. I need you to trust me as I do this work. And I know that it's hard for you, and I know it's painful for you, and I know it's not something you would have chosen, but trust me, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Your life as a believer is not your own. I am working in you and through you to accomplish my purpose. This is my plan. Again, not to be insensitive here, but we're not the center of our own story. Jesus in us is. And when we get that perspective, and when we begin to understand that a bit, it changes our perspective, changes our idea, changes our understanding. Here's how this plays out. Some of you are so busy bailing out the water of your sinking situation that you have forgotten that God is at work. Stop bailing. Be still. Be still. God knows. Doesn't make sense. He is aware. It's not really what you wanted. God knows. What can you learn about him in the midst of your pain and crisis? Sometimes we need to realize that it's not just about Jesus getting us through our storms. Although he does that, it's about him being sovereign and powerful, and the Lord over all things. You see, trials and tribulations, difficulties and desperate moments are when God does his greatest work in our lives. It's when he brings us to the end of ourselves that we might be driven to him and realize that he is alone, the Savior and Rescuer. Be still and know that he is working out his plan. There is purpose in it. Here's your asterisk. You ready? If you're taking notes, big asterisk. 
God's plan is not sin. Some of our calamities, our pain, our suffering is because someone is singing against us. That is not God's plan. God will use that for his glory through you as you trust him. But I don't want you to hear me say this morning that if someone is sinning against you and causing you harm because of their sin, that you should just rest and be okay with it. I'm not saying that this morning. I'm not calling you to continue to be a victim. I'm calling you as you're being victimized to trust in the Lord. There are people who want to help you. There are advocates and people who will come alongside you. And if you are feeling like you're being the the object of sin being poured to you, you need to seek help. There are people in our body, there are people in our church, there are people in our community who want to help rescue you. And God will use that in an incredible way. So hear me say, sin is coming to you and you're being a victim. It's not for you to rest in that. God's plan is that you be rescued from that. And so I want to challenge you in that a bit. When we're trying to stay afloat in our sinking situations, we might also ask, number two, God, where are you? God, where are you? Jesus tells the disciples, go across the sea. There's this huge storm. The boat's rocked back and forth. They're fearing for their life. The crisis comes, and it seems really out of the blue. They ask, God, where are you? When people hurt us, God, where are you? When a terrorist commits a terrible act of violence, God, where are you? When there's a sudden death, a cancer diagnosis, we ask ourselves, God, where are you? When the ship is about to be torn apart by the storm that's in you, God, where are you? And in this story, where is Jesus? He's asleep. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I just laugh at the Scripture. Jesus is asleep. And what's interesting about this is that Mark brings great detail to what's going on here. He doesn't just say that Jesus was sleepy. He doesn't say that he was tired. He's very descriptive here in verse 38. But he was asleep where? In the stern on what? On a cushion. As the boat's being rocked back and forth, to and fro, storms, lightning, thunder, great problems going on outside. Jesus is inside snoring. He slept hard. Now, let's talk about Jesus' humanity for a moment. He's tired. As you read the scripture, you understand that in his humanity, he's hungry. In his humanity, Jesus got angry. He cried. He died. And certainly here, he's a sleepy one. And so he sleeps. Now, some of you teenagers in the room are going to get a little wise to this right now. Sorry, Mom, I can't clean my room. I'm tired, so I'm going to go be like Jesus. <laughs> some of you men in the room are like, honey, I'd love to go mow the lawn, but you know what? If I'm really going to look like Jesus and you want me to be like Jesus, right, I need to go take a little nappy nap. Well, listen, Jesus is tired. He's worn out. And I love the contrast of this story. The disciples are frantically fearful, worried, scared, crying out, and Jesus is contently sleeping. And so it begs the question, why? Why is Jesus sleeping? Sure, he's tired. But secondly, I think it's from a much greater reality and purpose here. Jesus is sleeping because he wasn't bothered by the storm. Let that sink in just for a moment. His word to the disciples about their lack of faith seems to suggest that Jesus was able to sleep because of his faith. You see, in his humanity, Jesus exemplifies and models trust in the Father. Just as God told him to go to the other side of the sea, he's going to trust him on the journey, not just the destination. He sleeps. He's at rest. He's in the midst of the storm, an indication of complete and utter faith in the Lord. No matter what might occur, Jesus is trusting God. What an example. What a model for us. When we ask the question, where are you? We should realize and understand that he is right there. Brooke and I have very different sleeping habits. I'm not going to look at her so I don't embarrass her, but we're going to have a little conversation among family here about our sleeping habits. For one, I sleep in various positions. I roll over, I'm taking the sheets and the blanket, and I'm doing this back and forth. For her, though, Brooke is like an Egyptian mummy, still and steady all night long. I sleep like a slobbering idiot. Man, I've got, my mouth is open. I'm drooling all over the place. You can hear me down the hallway. I'm sleeping so loud. There have been more than one occasion I have rolled over and got my face next to her face to make sure that she's breathing. 
And she is. I don't know how she does it. The biggest difference between us is that when I hit the pillow, I'm out. I cannot be responsible for any important or vital information once my eyes get closed. This is a reality that we've come to know in our marriage relationship. Early on, that was tough for me. I would often get blamed for things that I had forgotten, and I thought, you know, I just don't remember you saying it. It was at that moment after my head hit the pillow. When she lays down, however, her mind wakes up. She's running a marathon in her mind, and I'm like a blubbering, sleepy, fat bear, right? I'm hibernating. That's what happens in our sleeping habits. I usually don't wake up. I usually am not driven to stay awake because I've got things going on in my life. I run fast to faith. It's just my gifting. It's just my trust in the Lord. But there are moments when I forget to do that and I worry. But when my head is the pillow, no matter what may be going on, I'm usually pretty gone. I think that's exactly what's going on here with Jesus. His faith in the Lord is so great he's willing to sleep. And I think some of us in the midst of our storm are asking ourselves, Jesus, are you asleep? And you wondered, where are you in the midst of my pain? Where are you in the midst of my problem? You're not seeing his activity. You're not sensing his presence. And you're asking yourself in worry and doubt, God, where are you? Isaiah chapter 43. It's become a favorite passage of scripture in the midst of these moments. And it was a, a scripture that we claimed when we lost our nephew. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And on the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. He is with us. When we ask the question, where are you, we need to hear his response. Be still, I am here. In the midst of the storm, be still. In the midst of the flood and the fire and the pain and the worry and the doubt, I am present. You may feel like Jesus is asleep on the job when you're in the midst of big suffering. When the hurricanes are bringing the water in over your, over your life, find yourself realizing that Jesus is not indifferent. He's not asleep. He's not gone. He is present in the midst of that storm. There is great comfort just in presence. When my daughter Lily was a baby, our firstborn was tough to go down as a sleeper. We had to rock him until we rocked ourselves to sleep. Our second child, like, literally went to the crib on his own. It was awesome. It's like, I'm going to sleep. There you go. It was great. And then there was Lily. You know, I think the Lord um, teaches us a lot as a parent, and uh, I'm just surprised we had a fourth child after Lily's baby experience. It was tough. I remember holding her and putting her down and walking away, and she'd be right back up yelling, screaming, crying. And so we as parents, we have these tricks, you know. And so, you know, there was only so much wailing one could handle. So I'd go in there. And I realized that as soon as I walked in the door, she would go down on the crib like she was in trouble. And she'd be real still. But the moment she realized I was no longer there, that's when she would begin to cry. And so as a parent, I remember thinking, well, I'm kind of stuck here. I can't really sleep in here. And so I'd walk in there and then I would do one of these. And I'd slowly back away from the crib, you know. As parents, I guess none of you parents ever did this. I was the only one, apparently. I'd slowly back away, and then I'd crouch down. You guys know what I'm talking about? And then I'm doing like the army roll out of the door. <laughs> it wasn't that I brought her a bottle or a pacifier. She just wanted me in the room. Isn't there a great comfort in presence? I would challenge you if you're asking yourself in these moments of, God, where are you? Be in the presence of the Lord and you'll find him. Sometimes it's faint. Sometimes it's big. Being engaged in worship, finding yourself in his word. When we're asking ourselves, God, where are you? My encouragement to you is what James does. James chapter 4. Draw near to him. and He will be near to you. When you get that phone call, God is there. When you receive the pink slip, God is there. When you lose that baby, 
God is there. You're never alone. And Scripture reminds us in Psalm 139, verse 7 and on, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. There is nowhere you can go outside the presence of the Lord. Amen. God, what is this? He replies, be still, it's my plan. God, where are you? He replies, be still, I'm here. And the last question we often ask ourselves in a seeking situation is, God, do you even care? God, do you even care? And this is what the disciples do in verse 38. Teacher, you do not care that we, do you not care that we are perishing? It's as if this this incredible moment's taking place. Everything's going wrong. They find him sleeping. They ask, do you even care? What a question. As we read up until this point, we've seen Jesus heal lepers and paralytics and cast out demons and teaching the lost. And you would think the disciples know that Jesus cares. But when it becomes personal, often we become doubtful. Pains me to admit this, but sometimes I am like the disciples where God has proven himself over and over to me, but sometimes I I ask this question, do you even care that I am perishing, that I am going through what I'm going through? Do you even care? You know, we read scriptures and we see God's deliverance. We hear testimonies of of healing and, and seeing that God can push the storms aside, but when it comes to us in the midst of our storms, we find ourselves doubting. And after this, Jesus wakes up and he says three words, peace, be still. The word peace is to be silent or to calm. This phrase be still is to close your mouth as if you're muzzling an ox. And the intent is implied to be a continuous action. So Jesus is saying, peace, be still, and stay that way. Be still and stay still. The result, the wind ceases, there's this great calm. I I can't imagine how eerie that must have felt that in this moment, there's water coming in and over, and there's clouds, and there's darkness and there's this great storm, and there's this great frantic and fear, and the, the sailors are wet with the, the seawater coming in and over them, and all of a sudden the moment, everything is cared for. When we ask ourselves, God, do you even care? We need to be reminded, especially in this story, his response, I am in control. Not only do I understand what's going on because this is part of my plan, not only am I present in the midst of your pain, but I am in control through your calamity. Jesus scolds him for lack of faith in verse 40. Why are you so afraid? Why do you still have no faith? Why are you still frantically overwhelmed by fear and worry? Why would you doubt my love for you? And in that moment of verse 41, they are filled with great fear. I think it's interesting that in this story here, when the storm stops, the fear continues. When the storm stops, there's still fear. And I think it's a different kind of reality. Certainly there's a fear of the storm, but in this moment, there's a fear of the Savior. Like, there's a moment here as the disciples are still learning about the identity of Jesus where they ask this question, who then is this? For even the wind and sea obey him. Now the true identity of Jesus' deity is beginning to shape and take form. Their fear is not in the man. Their fear is in the God-man who has the power even over the wind and even over the sea. They were so in awe of the power, so overwhelmed by him being in control. And Jesus, as if he was saying, I've been teaching you, I've been showing you, and now you realize, boys, I'm always in control. And the miracle of the storm doesn't just teach us how to endure adversity, although we see that. 
we can find ourselves receiving the peace be still concept that Jesus offers us by his knowledge, by his presence, and by his power. But the emphasis of the story is on who Jesus is. Not just that he rescues us, but on his identity. Listen, there are no stormless seas. Every sea has a storm, but not every ship has a rescuer. And when we as believers find our rescuer in Christ Jesus and him alone, we truly begin to understand the identity of who Christ is and who wants, he wants to do through us. We said this before here in this pulpit. It's not that Jesus is just going to deliver us from the storms. It's that he delivers us through the storms. I was studying yesterday. I came up, it's been kind of a long week, and I wasn't quite ready for this morning. So I came up yesterday and kind of wrapped my, my mind around a few things. It just spent some time in prayer. And as I was doing so, the Lord led me to, to Psalm 107. Now, this doesn't always happen, uh, but I am kind of thick skulled, And so the Lord is kind of digging in me a little bit. And this passage of Scripture just seems to be so fitting for this moment. I want to read it to you. Psalm 107, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. It's a little lengthy. But the phraseology and the picture that the Lord provides in this Old Testament passage against the landscape of what we just discovered in the New Testament, but maybe greater, the landscape of your life, I think is incredible. Psalm 107, starting in verse 23. I'm going to read out of the Holman Christian Standard Version. It says this. Others went to sea in ships, conducting trade on the vast waters. They saw the Lord's work, his wonderful works in the deep. He spoke and raised a tempest that stirred up the waves of the sea, rising up to the sky, sinking down to the depths, their courage melting away in anguish. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and all of their skill was useless. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a murmur, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They rejoiced when the waves grew quiet. Then he guided them to the harbor they longed for. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wonderful works for all of humanity. Let them exult him in the assemblies of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. God will quiet the storms to a murmur. He will hush your waves of the stormy seas. He will guide you to the harbor you long for. And we will rejoice. We'll do so in this life or the next. Brothers and sisters, Peace, be still.